So we've just seen in our previous video how to discover a presentation known as the Wertinger presentation for the knot group associated with an oriented knot. Remember, this is the fundamental group of the complement of that knot inside three-dimensional space. And the way that we got that, we found out, uh, was that we can assign to every arc, every oriented arc in that knot diagram, a generator for the knot group. And then to every crossing, we're going to assign a conjugation relation that relates the three loops that are incident at that arc, or at that crossing, um, and that those relations mirror as closely as possible with a group um, the fundamental quandal structure that relates the arcs that are incident at that crossing. So this is great. This gives us a presentation. It gives us something to work with to define this knot group. Um, but what it doesn't do is it doesn't necessarily illuminate the structure of this group in ways that are useful. Presentations for groups in group theory are notoriously challenging to work with uh, because they're sort of very concrete uh, and they don't always tell us enough about the, the actual structure of how the elements in this group interact one with another. So is there a way to take a presentation like this one for the fundamental group of the complement of the trefoil inside of three-dimensional space and simplify it? Um, what we're going to do are simplifications to this presentation of a group, um, sometimes called Tietze transformations or Tietze moves, um, that are going to try and uh, tell us more about the actual structure that exists in this group so that we can hopefully understand its structure better. So first and foremost, for this trefoil group, we notice that it's a group that's written in terms of three generators, but we also have three relations. It's a bit like if we had a system of three linear equations and three unknowns. If we had some tools by which we could reduce the number of equations that are there and therefore eliminate a variable, we might be able to understand better the kinds of uh, objects, elements, that satisfy all three of these equations, these relations. Um, so one of the options that we would have if we were trying to solve a 3 by 3 system, for example, is substitution. Taking what we know about one of the elements from one of the equations and substituting that knowledge into the other two. For example, if I took this first relation, C equals A inverse BA, and used it to substitute for C in the other two relations, then hopefully I'll be able to eliminate C from that system and therefore eliminate it from my presentation so that I only have two generators instead of three. What that looks like is just by taking A inverse BA and stuffing it in anywhere that I see C in the other two relations, I get from my third relation over here that A is really equal to B inverse A inverse BA B. So now I have a relation that just relates A and B to one another. And likewise from my second relation here, B equals A inverse BA quantity inverse times A times A inverse BA. So now I have two new relations that only engage the elements A and B. So let's simplify them a little bit if we can. If I try to simplify the relation here for uh, B, then I need to take the inverse of this product, and remember in any time we're working with groups, the inverse of a product is the product of the inverses in their reverse order. Uh, so I will transpose and invert uh, the elements that are here. So first I'll get the inverse of this element, A inverse, then I'll get the inverse of this element, B inverse, then I'll get the inverse of this element, A inverse inverse, which is A. So now I have A inverse B inverse A, A, A inverse B, A. And I can simplify that just a little bit by taking the A times A inverse that I see there and just writing it as the identity. So I have here two relations now, um, and each one of them expresses either A or B in terms of a product of five elements on the other side. If I rearrange each of these a little bit, by getting rid of the inverses and expressing them just in terms of a's and b's. In the case of my second relation, I can multiply by a on the left side to get rid of that a inverse, and then multiply by b on the left side to get rid of that b inverse. And the relation that I get now takes the form bab is equal to aba. If I do the same thing with my other relation up top, multiplying first by b on the left and then by a on the left, I get another relation which actually is identical to the other one. So an interesting thing happens when we apply this move to my presentation, substituting what I know about C into my other two relations. Both of the relations that we get as a consequence end up being exactly the same as one another. ABA is equal to BAB. So not only has eliminating one of my generators um, simplified down to two relations, in fact those two relations are identical, and so we end up with only one. And so this single substitution has now won for us a much simpler presentation for this group in terms of the two generators A and B and in terms of the single relation 
BAB is equal to ABA. So that's definitely a simpler presentation for this group. But can we do even better? One of the things that this presentation does not do for us is it doesn't tell us anything about the order of the elements that are in this group. Now we might rightly expect, based on the topological considerations of the fundamental group, that each of the elements A and B are going to have infinite order. Because after all, A, for example, is a base loop which links around the arc X exactly once. So if I take A and concatenate it with itself to get A squared, I'm going to get a loop that links around this arc twice, which is topologically distinct from the loop which loops around it only once. And likewise, if I loop three times around, I'm going to get something different, four times around, something different. And so every time I concatenate A with itself to wind more times around this arc, I'm going to get a new element that's distinct from the previous. And so there's no power n such that A to the n is going to get me back to the identity. No power of this uh, loop concatenated with itself any number of times is going to be contractible homotopically trivial. Um, and so each of the generators in this group is legitimately going to be a free, infinite order generator. And so this knot group is definitely an infinite group, and there's no way of getting around that. But it might still be nice if we can discover a presentation that tells us something about the powers of the generators A and B, rather than some relation that involves both A and B uh, on each side of the equation with one another. So let's think about ways that we might do better. If I play around with this relation a little bit, Maybe, let's say, multiplying it by some a's and b's again uh, in a way to try and make it simpler. If I multiply by a on the left, and then by b on the left again, and then by a on the left again, I'm just sort of playing around here. Um, you know, we could do a lot of different things. I I'm going somewhere with this one, um, but uh, where I'm going with this might not be immediately obvious. Um, what I'm actually trying to do on the left-hand side of this equation is to be able to express the left-hand side as the power of something. And so now that I've multiplied by a, B, and A, uh, what I have on the left-hand side is A, B times A, B times A, B. In other words, I have the third power of an element A times B. On the right-hand side, I have something that now kind of looks like a mess, A, B, A, A, B, A. Um, so one of the things I could do is I could use my relation A, B, A is equal to B, A, B to rearrange what I have on the right-hand side. Um, turns out I didn't have to do that, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, so that now what I've got is BAA times BAA. But what I've got now, again, on the left-hand side, is I have the third power of some element, namely the element A times B. On the right-hand side, I have the second power of another element, B times A times A, or BA squared. So what this means is that if I define a new element in my group called P equal to A times B, and if I define a new element Q called B times A squared, then this relation, BAB is equal to ABA, turns out to be equivalent to the relation P to the third equals Q to the second. So P cubed equals Q squared. And that's kind of a much friendlier relation to work with, particularly if we end up having to simplify uh, products of elements inside of this group. It's much easier to use that relation than it is to use BAB is equal to ABA, because we don't always have these kinds of arrangements of A's and B's, but we might find ourselves with three P's next to each other or two Q's next to each other. Um, so it's a much easier relation to understand. The only thing we don't yet know is whether this presentation, which has P and Q as generators, and P to the third is equal to Q squared, if this really is the same group up to isomorphism as the group that we started with. So if we change from A's and B's to generate my group into P's and Q's with this relation, do we really get the same group at the end of the day? And to get some certainty about that, we just need to know that we can go both directions. So this definition of P and Q in terms of A and B gives me a monomorphism and injective homomorphism from the group with this presentation into the group with this presentation. It just says, take my A and B, combine them together in these ways to form a P and a Q. I also need to know that I can go the opposite direction. So can I solve these relations to get A and B uniquely expressed in terms of P and Q? So we'll just do some linear algebra, if you like, except it's in the abstract algebra realm. We just need to know that we can solve the equations uh, for A and B in terms of P and Q. I'll spare you the, the details of that, but you can see them if you pause the video and check my work. Uh, it turns out that we can solve for A as P inverse times Q, and B as Q inverse times P to the minus 2. Uh, sorry, this should say P to the, the positive 2. That's a typo. Um, so it turns out that, yes, not only can we define P and Q in terms of A and B uniquely, we can also define A and B in terms of P and Q uniquely. 
and therefore each of these groups with these presentations is the monomorphic image of the other, and therefore they are isomorphic as groups. So that's great. Um, that means that we actually have simplified this presentation pretty considerably. And in fact, this is probably the simplest presentation that we're going to get for the knot group of the trefoil. Um, I just want to close by trying to relate this group back to other groups that we already know from group theory. And the other group that we know of that has a presentation similar to this one is the dihedral group of symmetries of the equilateral triangle, D6, sometimes called D3. It also turns out that it's isomorphic to the symmetric group on three symbols, S3. And so how, what's the relationship? Well, the dihedral group has as generators a reflection across any of the reflective axes of symmetry of this equilateral triangle, called T, and then also a 120 degree order 3 rotation about the center of this equilateral triangle that we'll call R. And a presentation for the dihedral group is that it's generated by this rotation and this reflection, and the rotation has order 3, and the reflection has order 2, and therefore R cubed and T squared are equal to the identity. But that also means that R3 and T squared happen to be equal to one another, which should be a familiar echo. And there's one other relation that also describes how the T and R, how the rotation and reflection interact with one another. And in the dihedral group of the triangle, that relation is RT, RT is equal to the identity. So here's a presentation for the dihedral group of the triangle. And it looks an awful lot like our knot group. In particular, the very first relation that we have in our set of relations in this presentation is the relation that's completely the same as the relation for the knot group of the trefoil. R cubed is equal to T squared. P cubed is equal to Q squared. So if we want to make the analogy of our knot group to uh, the dihedral group of the triangle, the role of the order 3 rotation is played by P, AB. In other words, uh, we could think of that as the concatenation of this loop with that loop inside of my knot diagram. And the role of the reflection, the order 2 element, is played by Q, uh, which is uh, B times A squared. So we could, we could draw what that loop is over here as well. But the dihedral group has this extra information. Not only do we know there that the third power of R is equal to the second power of T, we know that those are both equal to the identity. It turns out that's what makes this a finite group, where we cannot say that our knot group is a finite group. Because even though these are equal to one another, they're not in turn equal to the identity. And so we can have words of infinite length. And likewise, the Nahidra group has this extra relation here as well, which if it existed in our knot group would say PQ, PQ is equal to the identity. That's also clearly not something that we can guarantee based on this presentation. So the knot group is not the same as the dihedral group, um, but what this all means is that there is a surjective homomorphism, in other words, an epimorphism, from my sort of large infinite knot group onto the dihedral group that has this presentation. So somehow my knot group is much, much bigger than the dihedral group of the triangle, and yet it does mirror some of the same structure as the elements in that dihedral group. So you can imagine how if we build the knot groups for larger knots using the same procedure, we might be able to relate it to some similar finite groups and capture some of that structure, but these knot groups are all going to be infinite, and so the analogy is never going to be perfect. But at least this gives us a recipe for some things that we can do to simplify Wertinger presentations in a way that can hopefully illuminate some more of the abstract algebraic structure that exists inside of knot groups.